Thank you for your interest in Quadrifire. We believe the Quadrifire 1000 and 1100i pellet burning appliances are the finest pellet burning stoves on the market today. But like all fine machines, they need service periodically to remain in prime condition. And that's where you come in. Quality service is important to our customers. In the next few minutes, we'll give you an introduction to the unique ignition system, and we will cover a few of the safety-related features on the Quadrifire 1100. We will then give a few installation tips, cover adjusting procedures, and other dealer service issues. We hope this information helps you do your job better, and thank you for your attention. To begin, we will explain how the Quadrifire 1100 works. The 1100 is an advanced appliance with a revolutionary self-ignition system that provides ignition within minutes of startup. The fire in the stove is then controlled by a number of automatic sensors and safety systems. Together, they make stove operations simple, easy, and safe. The Quadrifire 1100's automatic ignition sequence is very sophisticated and highly dependable. In fact, the cycle is so advanced it's simple. Basically, when the stove gets a call for heat, timers run the stove until it gets to a certain temperature. Then the stove stays running by temperature and thermostat demand. The stove returns to timers for a shutdown when the room thermostat is satisfied. Operating a quadrifier unit is as easy as adjusting your thermostat. When a thermostat connected to the system is turned up, it sends a call for heat and the stove starts on an automatic ignition cycle. On the appliance, the call light comes on, indicating the stove is receiving a call for heat. The exhaust blower comes on, creating a partial vacuum in the burn pot. And the feed motor starts, delivering a few pellets to the fire pot. And the igniter comes on. Ignition is sensed and monitored by a thermocouple in the fire pot. A low flame will send a temperature reading of 200 degrees to the control box. If this happens within two minutes, the igniter will turn off and the feed motor will continue to operate, allowing the fire to build. If 200 degrees is not sensed in about two minutes, the feed motor will stop, but the igniter will stay on for about four more minutes. This allows fuels that are more difficult to light a bit more time to start burning. When ignition occurs, it will heat the thermocouple to 200 degrees, signaling the control box. The green light on the control box will light, and the feed motor will resume delivering pellets. The stove is now in transition from startup to normal operating temperatures. The incoming fuel means that the fire will increase in size, sending a hotter 1,000 degree message to the control box. At the control box, the red light comes on, signaling that the stove is operating normally. Once this happens, the stove will continue to burn until the thermostat is satisfied. Essentially, the stove has only one setting, full on. This provides the most efficient combustion possible. The bottom line is we put more heat per pound of fuel into the room. The shutdown sequence is also timed. When the thermostat is satisfied, the call light goes out and the stove goes from its burn cycle to a shutdown cycle. The feed system turns off, stopping the flow of pellets to the fire pot. The exhaust blower continues to run for about eight minutes, burning and exhausting the remaining fuel in the burn pot. As you can see, the open flame has gone out and burning embers are blowing out of the fire pot. This is how the fire pot cleans itself. Then, the exhaust blower shuts off until the thermostat again calls for heat. The convection blowers move air over the heat exchanger and the top of the firebox, delivering heat into the room. They are totally automatic and totally temperature controlled. They turn on when a temperature of 125 degrees is sensed in the convection chamber. The blowers will continue to remove heat, even after the fire is out. When the temperature in the convection chamber falls below 105, they will turn off. This automatic startup and shutdown sequence makes the appliance both easy to operate and very dependable. There are also three safety systems built into the stove. First, there is a vacuum switch that will turn off the feed motor if the front door is left open or the exhaust system becomes clogged. Second, there is a snap disc that will turn off the stove like a thermostat does. This can happen if the convection blowers don't turn on or if they fail while the stove is running. 
Third, another snap disc turns off the stove if the pellets at the top of the feed tube reach over 200 degrees. The pellets ignited about 400 degrees, so as you can see, we have a wide margin for safety. Next, let's look at what the individual components do and locate them within the unit. Please note how the components work together in the automatic systems. A thorough understanding of how the systems work will greatly aid in troubleshooting. We've asked Donna from the Aladdin Steel Pellet Line to be our guide and help us today. We'll begin by opening the front door. This is the heat exchanger cover. In the back, there is a stainless steel firebox liner. On the side is the feed chute. The white tube holds the thermocouple which rests on the fire pot. In the front there are two ash pans. And the air wash vents that help keep the glass clean. Here on top is the heated convection air outlet. And on the side is the left room air intake. There's another intake on the bottom. The side plates are removable and held by these Allen screws. Just visible in the hole at the bottom, you can see the left side power supply cover plate. It's behind the side plate. The right side also has top and bottom room air intakes. And like the left side, the right side is also removable. It's secured by two Allen screws. The holes are for the power cord, thermostat wires, the call light, and the restart button. The hopper lid is adjustable. From the factory, it is set to a standard 22-inch fireplace. It can be lowered to 18 and a half inches. You can open the side panel by removing the 10 edge screws. Removing this panel will give access to snap disc 2, the thermocouple, and the igniter leads the wire harness, and the power leads to the small convection blower. As we rotate the stove, note that the back panel is also removable. From the left, you can see the exhaust stack. On top is the exhaust plate. It's held securely in place by two clamps. The exhaust plate is removable. This means that the stove is easier to install and easier to clean and service. The left side is also removable. It is secured, again, with 10 screws. Removing this panel gives access to the exhaust blower, the exhaust ducting, the left side of the wire harness, the orange convection ducting, which holds the air going from the convection blower to the heat exchanger. As we said before, the left side is removable. The Allen screws take the 5 seconds inch Allen wrench that we provide. This side gives you access to the left side components. Here on the left, we have the feed motor. This hose runs from the nipple on the feed chute to the vacuum switch over here on the left wall. On the back wall is a cover plate allowing access to the exhaust stack in a zero clearance installation. Because the exhaust plate is removable, this means easier access for cleaning and service. Back on the feed tube, you can see snap disc number three with its red reset button. This is the large convection air blower, and beside it are the capacitors that drive this blower and the exhaust blower. 
This is the left side power supply. On the bottom is the combustion air inlet. We'll now rotate the stove and remove the right side. Again, this side is held by two 5-32nd inch Allen screws. When you remove the side, you can see two boxes. The top box is the control box, housing the temperature indicator lights. The bottom box is the junction box. On the side wall, you can see snap disc number one. This disc controls both convection air blowers. In back of it, you can see snap disc number two. This is a safety system that shuts the stove off if it gets too hot. We're just giving you an overview for now. We'll cover the elements in detail later. Here is a closer view of the control box. On top are the red and green thermocouple temperature indicator lights. Below it is the junction box. The terminal block at the back holds the thermocouple leads. Here's the fuse. And in the front, there is the thermostat terminal block, the restart button, and the red call light. Below it is the right side power supply. The 1100 can receive power from either side of the stove. Remove the top screw and the cover plate will swing out of the way. Warning, only remove the cover plate on the side that you are bringing power into the stove from. For safety, the unit should only be attached to a properly grounded receptacle. The stove runs on 120 volts, 60 hertz AC. The cord is a standard computer cord. For an alternative power supply, you may use a generator that produces a minimum of 700 watts of AC power. The stove is designed to run on a 24 volt AC thermostat. The thermostat turns the stove on by closing the thermostat circuit when heat is required. This is the most economical kind of thermostat to purchase, but it's also not as consumer friendly. It has a set of points that seem to keep the thermostat engaged to a setting generally higher than the set temperature. Likewise, it won't trigger until it's well below the set temperature. This means a wide temperature swing in the consumer's home. The second style has a glass bulb with mercury inside of it. The mercury style won't have such a wide temperature swing, yet it's still very reasonably priced. It's important to mount this style of thermostat level. If it's not, it will give a false reading. When hooking up the thermostat, attach the white wire from the thermostat to the top center lug of the junction box and the red 24 volt wire to the bottom center lug. Right near the thermostat connections, we have the fuse. The fuse is a standard 7 amp AGC number 7 120 volt fuse. To check it, push in on it, turn it counterclockwise, then pull it out. The light is a 28 volt AC bulb number 85 lamp. It indicates that the thermostat is calling for heat. The restart button is just beside the light. When pushed, it momentarily opens the thermostat circuit. When released, it closes the circuit, restarting the automatic ignition cycle. Note that the reset will only work when the thermostat is calling for heat and the call light is on. The junction box houses the fuse, the restart button, the thermostat call light, it's the connection point for the wiring harness, the right side power inlet, the thermostat, and the thermocouple. The control box houses the electronics, which control all functions of the stove, except for the convection blowers, which are controlled by snap disk number one. In essence, this is the electrical brain for the stove. The solid state logic in the control box means that if the thermostat is calling for heat, the stove will automatically relight after a power failure. This system pulls pellets up the feed tube from the hopper and drops them down the feed chute into the fire pot. 
It has a coil spring without a solid center shaft. The spring is much smaller than the diameter of the tube it fits into. This means that it won't cut or grind pellets into sawdust. It's highly resistant to jams and is one of the special features that make our product so superior to other pellet burning appliances. The fire pot is made of cast ceramic and is designed with air intake ports or holes that swirl the fire and help to remove ash. For clarity, we are showing this on a cutaway fire pot in a Quadrifire 1000. The function and design of the pots in the 1100 is identical. When there is a fire in the fire pot, air entering from the bottom creates a cyclone of fire. To make cleaning the fire pot easier, a removable clean-out plug was designed into the bottom of the fire pot. The igniter is made of a cast silicon carbide ceramic material. The element is suspended above the lower end of the ramp on the clean-out plug. The element quickly reaches a temperature of 2600 degrees Fahrenheit when power is applied. When the stove is starting up, a few pellets will fall down the ramp. The igniter superheats the air which swirls around them and ignites them. This flame then flows up the ramp into the main burn chamber of the fire pot where it ignites the rest of the pellets. Once the fire is burning, airflow up the ramp stops pellets from coming down the ramp. This is two wires made of different metals that produce a low voltage which increases with temperature. The thermocouple itself is protected by a ceramic tube called the thermocouple protection cover. The thermocouple senses the temperature in the fire and when it reaches 200 degrees, it will turn on the green light on the control box. Then at 1000 degrees, it will turn on the red light. This blower delivers air into an enclosed plenum that passes over the top of the firebox. It helps to cool the box and delivers heat into the room through the top vent on the front. This convection blower is accessed from the left. This blower circulates air through the ducting where it hits the middle of the heat exchanger. It drops the air down, then up through the heat exchanger. This creates a turbulent airflow, which increases heat transfer. It then delivers this hot air into the room through the bottom two vents in the front. This blower is driven by a four microfarad capacitor on the left-hand side of the stove. The exhaust blower is located from the left rear. This blower pulls exhaust out of the firebox through the fins on the heat exchangers. Here's a view of the firebox side of the heat exchanger. The air is sucked out the bottom into the tube at the rear. The exhaust is pulled from the firebox through the tube at the bottom to the exhaust blower. But from the blower out, the exhaust system is under pressure and any connections in the exhaust system will need to be well sealed. The exhaust blower is driven by a 3 microfarad capacitor on the left-hand side of the stove. This hose runs from the nipple on the feed chute to the vacuum switch over here on the left wall. The switch must sense vacuum from the firebox chamber in order for the feed motor to run. This is a safety device designed to shut off the feed system if the front door is open, if the exhaust blower fails, or if the exhaust becomes plugged by ash or any other foreign material. This is the first snap disc from the front. This snap disc turns the convection blowers on and off as needed. This disc senses the temperatures and turns the blowers on when it reaches a temperature of 125 degrees Fahrenheit and off when the temperature falls to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the second disc from the front and has two yellow leads running from it. This is an important safety system. 
The disc turns the stove off if an overfire occurs or if the convection blowers fail. This disc opens at 250 degrees Fahrenheit and breaks the thermostat circuit. It automatically resets when the stove cools down. This disc is mounted on the stove's left side. It's on the feed tube. It's another safety device. It will not allow pellets at the top of the feed tube to exceed 200 degrees. So if for any reason the fire tries to burn back into the feed system or exhaust pushes up the feed tube, this snap disc will turn the entire stove off just as if you'd unplug the stove. There's one aluminum finned heat exchanger on this stove. This exchanger is located to the right of the firebox and is accessible through the front door. The quadrifire heat exchangers have been made with aluminum because they have 10 times the thermal conductivity of stainless steel. The fins dramatically increase the heat exchange surface available in a relatively small area. To install the optional angled exhaust plate, release the clamps and remove the stock exhaust plate and replace it with the angled exhaust plate. When hooking exhaust pipe to this stove, thoroughly silicone the flex pipe. Remember the exhaust will be under pressure so it's important to get a good seal. Now place the pipe on the exhaust plate and secure it with at least three screws. The exhaust is under pressure, so be sure that the plate is secured and the gasket is good. This kit allows the stove to receive combustion air from outside the house. The kit comes with high temperature flex ducting, two hose clamps, and an outside air collar. Clamp the high temperature flex ducting to the combustion air inlet with a hose clamp and secure it well. Now remove the outside air cover plate and replace it with the outside air collar. You can now attach ducting from the air inlet to the top of this collar. Clamp the high temperature flex ducting to the bottom of the outside air collar with the remaining hose clamp. Note the cutout for screwdriver access. Be sure the ducting does not touch the exhaust blower. It will help to keep the ducting out of the way of the blower if you give it a half twist when installing it. The hopper is adjustable. We'll have Donna point out all of the screws you'll need to remove to adjust the hopper. If you are lowering the hopper all the way, it may also be necessary to remove the left side and the access door to allow clearance. In most cases, you will only need to slide the hopper cover downwards to the proper height. We're just removing this cover to give you a better view. There are four pre-drilled holes on either side that take the lid from 22 inches to 18 and a half inches. Obviously, the larger the hopper, the more fuel the stove can hold. When lowering the hopper, you'll need to drill new holes. Always seal uncovered holes to prevent sawdust from getting out the back of the unit. We recommend that you use thread cutter screws for this. On every new installation, make sure you loosen the screw securing the feed adjustment plate at the bottom of the hopper just enough so that the plate will move with firm pressure on the feed adjustment rod. To install the optional panel set, 
Begin by removing the left and right sides and loosening the three screws on the top of the hopper. Next, put the top into place by sliding the slots behind the screw heads. Use a flat bladed screwdriver to snap the nuts into place in the slots on the legs. Then attach the legs to the top using the screw provided in the kit. As you can see, this is a very quick and easy installation and the results are quite dramatic. Next, install the remaining screws securing the legs to the stove sides. Finally, install the gold trim and tighten the clamps with a screwdriver. Here's what the finished installation looks like from the front. Once the stove has been installed, you're ready to burn the unit for the first time. You will notice that when you first plug the stove in, the exhaust blower comes on. Make sure that the thermostat is set below room temperature. Next, take a handful of pellets and put them into the fire pot. This will let the fire start even though the feed system is not full of fuel. Close and latch the door. Now, adjust the thermostat to a setting above the current room temperature. The stove may not stay burning on the first try, so it may be necessary to add more fuel by hand or push the restart button. Let the stove run for 15 minutes to reach operating temperature before attempting any adjustments. Remember, there are two things that are necessary to keep the stove running. One, the thermocouple must read 1,000 degrees, and the thermostat must be calling for more heat. If either of these conditions is absent, the stove will go into shutdown mode. A properly adjusted fire has a short, active flame pattern. This fire has tall flames with black tails, and you can see that it's somewhat lazy. Note that at higher elevations, the fire tends to be bigger, so start adjusting this type of fire by sliding the feed adjustment plate down about one half inch. Within about five minutes, your adjustments will have taken effect. If the fire is still too tall, lower the feed adjustment plate again. If the fire is still lazy and you've reached the end of travel for the plate, inspect the fire pot gasket. Also, inspect the heat exchanger clean out door gasket. A bad gasket will leak, causing a lazy fire. If the gasket is properly seated, you may need to open the air adjustment plate. You will rarely need to adjust this plate. However, when you do, open it in about one half inch increments until the fire has a nice active flame pattern. Note that before adjusting the air on a stove that's been installed for a time, check the exhaust system for any obstructions. This fire is properly adjusted and has short active flames from two to four inches out of the fire pot. When the fire is too small and rarely peaks above the top of the fire pot, like this one, then you will need to increase the feed rate by adjusting the plate upwards. If the plate reaches the end of travel and the fire is still low and very active, you will have to close the air adjustment about one half inch until the flame is properly adjusted like this one. Take some time with a new installation to instruct the customer how to do this procedure. Show them how to adjust the feed rate. Explain that if the glass is getting black, the fire is probably too high and that the fire pot will have to be cleaned more often, and that the heat exchangers and the exhaust system will also need more frequent cleaning. 
it may be necessary to adjust the feed rate if they change brands of fuel. Fuel pellets are basically made from sawdust or wood byproducts. If the source material was hardwood, it will have a higher mineral content, creating a heavier ash. Minerals and other unburnable materials, such as sand, will turn into glass when heated to the extreme temperatures our fire pot reaches. This is what forms clinkers in the bottom of a fire pot. Trees from different areas will vary in mineral content. That's why some fuels make more clinkers than others. Pellets are manufactured in either 1 quarter inch or 5 16 inch diameters and many varying lengths. Pellet length may even vary by lot from the same manufacturer. That's why the feed rate may need to be adjusted occasionally. We recommend that customers buy fuel in multi-ton lots whenever possible. Buying larger quantities of fuel at once will greatly reduce the number of times feed adjustments will need to be made. to troubleshoot the stove, you must first determine what shut the stove off. We will assume that the thermostat is calling for heat and that the red call light is on. If this is the case, you now have to look in the fire pot to see what state it's in. It will be in one of three states. The first possibility is that there are unburned pellets in the fire pot. This tells us that the stove has simply missed an ignition. Clean the fire pot and pay attention to the amount of ash and clinker buildup in the stove. If there's very little ash, it may be possible that too much air is passing over the igniter. If this is the case, the stove will have always had slow starts. On some fire pots, the air hole over the igniter may be too large. You will need to restrict the airflow over the igniter. This can be done by using stove gasket cement and restricting this hole by about half. When done, it should be no smaller than one eighth of an inch tall by three quarters of an inch wide. This will speed the ignition cycle. Be sure to allow at least one hour for the cement to set properly before lighting the stove. If there was a lot of ash, find out how long it has been since the stove was cleaned. If it was just cleaned, we either have poor fuel in the stove or the stove is burning with a lazy fire. A lazy fire can result from a bad fire pot gasket or a bad heat exchanger clean out door gasket. Be sure the exhaust system is clean and check the heat exchangers and see that they are not plugged. Now start the stove and read the fire. It may be necessary to reduce the feed rate and or increase the air at the air adjustment plate. It's important that you end up with a nice active flame pattern that reaches two to four inches out of the fire pot. The second possibility is that there are partially burned pellets in the bottom. As you can see, the pellets on the right side of the pot are gone but on the left side, the pellets are scorched. This tells us that the fire started, but it never reached 200 degrees. This points to the thermocouple. It either was not in the pot or the protection tube was not touching the end of the thermocouple. If it appears to be properly installed, you will want to remove the protection tube and inspect the welded ends. If the end has eroded away or the wires have come apart like this one did, you will need to replace it. The third possibility is that the fire pot has some ash and is free from pellets, just as if the stove went through a normal shutdown. First, look in the hopper for fuel. Remember, our feed system is unique and that as the fuel gets to the bottom of the hopper, it will reduce the feed rate and the fire may drop below 1,000 degrees, shutting down the stove. Here's what's happening. For some reason, the fire pot temperature that the thermocouple senses is dropping below 1,000 degrees. It could be as simple as the end of the protection tube not in contact with the thermocouple or that the thermocouple is not properly located in the fire pot. If that does not appear to be the case, it's probably related to the fuel in the hopper. We had a square feed adjustment plate on our earlier models and it was possible for pellets to bridge, preventing them from entering the feed system. If this is the case, replace this plate with an angled feed adjustment plate.
There is one aluminum finned heat exchanger on this stove. To clean the heat exchanger, remove the heat exchanger cover by sliding it upwards and into the firebox. It will then remove through the front door. Also, remove the heat exchanger clean-out door. This door is in the bottom of the firebox. Brush and then vacuum the heat exchanger and the heat exchanger housing. Be sure to firmly tighten the heat exchanger clean-out door when done. This is important or the stove will not burn properly. With wear, the door gasket will flatten slightly, causing a poor seal. To tighten the door, remove the nut on the handle. Also, remove the cam and the keeper. Lastly, remove and discard the washer. When you reinstall the keeper, the cam, and the nut, the door should now fit snugly. There is a ring-shaped gasket between the fire pot and the fire box floor. If it should be necessary to remove the fire pot, be sure to inspect this gasket and replace it if necessary. As the fire pot wears, the hole going down to the ignition chamber will enlarge slightly. Also, the dome will show a reduction in size and some wear. This is normal and will not affect the function of the fire pot. If there's no breach in the fire pot surface, the pot is good. However, if a hole has formed in the fire pot wall by the ignition chamber, or if the dome has a hole in it, as we're showing you here with this flashlight, the pot will need to be changed. To clean the fire pot, be sure to unplug the stove first. Now, open the front access door and remove the plug from the base of the fire pot. Also, open the main door and use the scraper to clean the fire pot. Scrape the bottom of the pot and ash will fall down into the pan below. Remove any debris on the cleanout plug and reinstall it in the bottom of the fire pot. When you are finished, dump the ashes into a metal container. necessary. The igniter may be visually inspected by removing the clean-out plug from the fire pot. The element is very brittle, so care must be taken in handling it. The small convection blower should be checked for dust accumulation and cleaned every six months. This blower requires no lubrication. Remove the right side and brush and vacuum the impellers. Also, clean out the whole compartment to help reduce dust getting into the stove. The large convection blower should be cleaned at least once each heating season, or more often if there are many pets in the house. The impeller on this blower can also be cleaned with a brush and vacuum. To clean the exhaust stack, remove the zero clearance access door on the left side. You can now reach through and unclamp the exhaust ducting and lift it out of the way. You will now be able to thoroughly clean the exhaust stack. We will now revisit elements in the stove, giving directions for part testing and replacement. Be aware that there is a shock hazard whenever you work on a unit while power is supplied to it. 
The light is a 28 volt AC bulb number 85 lamp. If replacement is necessary, remove the lens cap by turning counterclockwise about a sixteenth of a turn. The cap should then pull straight off. To remove the bulb, pull it straight out without turning it. This stove is designed to run on a 24 volt AC thermostat. We recommend that you use a new thermostat when installing this stove. Almost all thermostats have a heat anticipator, which is simply a miniature heating element built in. The heat anticipator must be adjusted to match the current rating draw of the thermostat circuit. On the Quadrifier 1000 or 1100, the current rating is 0 0.05 amps. That's a lower setting than most heat anticipators will go, so the heat anticipator should be set to the lowest setting possible. This will give your customers the best performance. The disc will have the numbers F125-20 on the side. Should this disc fail, the convection blowers will either run continually or fail to turn on. The orange wires bring power to the disc and to the junction box. The purple wire sends power to the convection blowers through the wiring harness. To replace the disc, remove the wires from the disc. Then, use a short Phillips screwdriver to remove the two mounting screws. The order of the wires does not matter when reconnecting the leads. This disc has the numbers L250-40 on the side. This disc opens at 250 degrees and breaks the thermostat circuit. It resets automatically when the stove cools down. If the thermostat won't turn the stove on, disconnect the leads. You can now use a short jumper wire to test this disc by shorting the leads. If the stove now comes on, the disc is bad and should be replaced. The disc is secured just like snap disc number one with two screws. This disc has the numbers L200-M on the side. This disc rarely requires replacement. All of the power for the stove flows through it, so the disc is working if any part of the stove will turn on. Sometimes in shipment, the disc will trip. Reset it by pushing the red button in the middle. The gray wire brings power from the fuse, and the orange wire leads to snap disc number one. To change the disc, disconnect the wires. The order doesn't matter when you reinstall. and use a flat bladed screwdriver to pry open the fitting. Make sure the disc rests snugly against the feed tube when you reinstall. If this blower fails, it will trip snap disc number two or possibly number three. Begin replacement by unplugging the two wires leading to the wire harness. Now, remove the four nuts from the blower studs. A flexible drive helps in accessing these nuts. Unlike the other blowers, this blower is not driven by a capacitor. When you reinstall, put a bead of silicone around the mouth of the blower. This will act as a gasket and seal the blower, providing a better airflow. Now, place the blower on the mounting studs. Note that the notch on the clamping strap goes to the bottom when you reinstall the blower. Power to this blower is supplied via a purple wire coming from the wiring harness to the 4 microfarad capacitor. The light blue lead from the blower goes to the white ground lead from the wiring harness. Begin by unplugging this lead. Now pull the rubber cover off the capacitor and, for safety, discharge the capacitor. This will expose the leads. Note that the brown wire plugs into one side of the capacitor while the black and purple wires plug into the opposite side. That they are on the opposite sides is important. 
which side isn't. Now unplug these leads and pull the purple lead through the rubber protection cover. The blower is secured by four nuts on the blower mounting studs. Again, a flexible drive will make it easier to access these nuts. When reinstalling the blower, place silicone around its outlet to act as a gasket. Begin replacing this blower by cutting the wire tie holding the wiring harness. Next, unplug the light blue wire from the white one coming from the wiring harness. This blower is driven by the three microfarad capacitor, so remove its protection cover. Note that the brown wire goes to one side, while the blue and black wires are on the other side. It's important to keep these on opposite sides of the capacitor when reinstalling. Now, pull the blue wire through the cover. Detach the green ground wire coming from the blower. Now remove the four screws securing the blower to its housing. Because it's siliconed on, you'll probably need to use a flat bladed screwdriver to pry the blower off. When reinstalling, silicone both sides of the gasket. Ensure that you get a good seal. The exhaust is under pressure and will leak if you do not. Now position the blades and reinstall the blower. The switch has two wires, a black one from the feed motor and a red one. To replace the switch, unplug the wires and remove the vacuum hose. Note you should always check the hose for any obstructions. The switch is held by two screws. The 1100 also had a white model vacuum switch. The replacement kit for this style switch comes with a short set of jumper wires that are used only if the existing stove leads are too short. The order of the wires doesn't matter, so simply unhook the old switch and hook up the new one. Mounting the new switch is simple. Just peel the backing off the double face tape on the back and mount the switch on the zero clearance access door. Now secure it with a firm press. Anytime work has been done on the vacuum switch, test it by letting the stove run until it is hot. Verify that the feed motor stops soon after the front door is opened, and that it restarts soon after the door is closed. The feed motor and the feed screw are all part of an assembly and will be removed as one unit. The feed motor runs on a 120 volt AC power supply. If the feed motor fails to start and power is present at the motor, it will be necessary to remove the assembly. Begin by unplugging the motor leads. Next, use a wrench to remove the two bearing mounting nuts and the entire feed assembly will pull free. It's possible that some large object was lodged in the feed assembly and that that stalled the motor. You can now test the motor and replace it if necessary.